Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jose Romero. Um, we're calling into session uh, the uh, Friday, Friday, April 23rd, um, 2001, emergency meeting of the ACIP to discuss Janssen uh, vaccine. Um, and my knuckles will serve as the gavel. Um, so welcome, everybody. Before we begin, I want to thank everyone for their time, um, the commitment that they've given uh, to this uh, process. Um, and uh, to work group members, uh, liaisons and ex-officios, and also uh, to our administrative staff for putting all this together, and of course uh, to uh, Dr. Oliver for um, all the work that she's done. Um, so we'll go forward. Uh, Dr. Cohen, please. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, welcome to the April 23rd virtual ACIP meeting. Uh, copies of the slides being presented at today's meeting are available on the ACIP website. If they are not up there at this moment, they are being put up there as we speak. Um, additionally, um, slides are available through a share link file uh, for uh, voting and ex officio and liaison members. Next slide. A few notes on meeting logistics for those who are listening in on the Zoom line. Please mute your lines at all times unless you're called on for discussion. Uh, when Dr. Romero opens the meeting for discussion or questions, please virtually raise your hand. Um, do not use the comment box. During the discussion period, Dr. Romero will take questions first from voting ACIP members and then from ex officio and liaison representatives. Uh, we will try to stay on schedule as much as possible. Uh, we do have a scheduled com public comment period for this afternoon. Um, please disable your video during the meeting um, until uh, we have a motion on the table uh, and ACIP votes. At that time, the ACIP voting members will turn on their uh, uh, cameras for the vote. Next slide. Engagement with the public and transparency in our process is vital to ACIP's work. Uh, for this uh, meeting, we'll be holding one oral public comment period this afternoon. It will occur at approximately 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, people interested in making an oral comment, comment were requested to submit a request online in advance of the meeting. Um, priority was given to those advanced requests. Um, and we conduct a blind randomized lottery to determine who the speakers will be. Speakers selected in the lottery for this meeting have been notified in advance of the meeting, although not very far in advance, um, so we appreciate everybody's patience. Members of the public can also submit written public comments via regulations.gov using docket number uh, ID CDC slash 2021 slash 0044. Information on written public comment process, including um, how to make a public comment, can be found on the ACIP meeting website. Next slide. Um, as noted in the ACIP Pro Policies and Procedures Manual, members of the ACIP agree to forego participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. For certain other interests that potentially enhance a member's expertise, CDC has issued limited conflicts of interest waivers. Members who conduct vaccine clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards may present to the committee on matters related to that vac those vaccines, but these members are prohibited from participating in committee votes on issues related to those vaccines. Regarding other vaccines of the concerned company, a member may participate in the discussion, but must abstain from all votes related to the vaccine of that company. At the beginning of each meeting and prior to each vote, ACIP members will state any conflict of interest. Next slide. I will now pass it over to uh, Dr. Romero to uh, begin uh, taking a uh, roll call. And um, uh, we appreciate your patience uh, today. It'll be a long day, um, but uh, we look forward to the discussion. Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. So I will call the roll. Um, and um, for ACIP members, I'm going to ask that you please state your affiliation and if you have any conflicts of interest. Um, and the same uh, with the liaisons. So uh, begin, um, I'm Jose Romero. I'm uh, the Arkansas Secretary of Health, um, uh, Professor of Pediatrics and Infectious Diseases at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, um, and I have no conflicts. Dr. Alt. 
My name is Kevin Alt, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist at the University of Kansas Health System in Kansas City, Kansas, and I have no conference. Good morning and welcome. Uh, Ms. Bata. Good morning, this is Lynn Bata. I am the, the immunization clinical consultant with the Department of Health, and I have no conflict. Good morning, welcome. Dr. Bell. Uh, Beth Bell, clinical professor, Department of Global Health, University of Washington, and I have no conflict. Welcome, good morning. Dr. Bernstein. Hello, everyone. I'm Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I have no conflict. Good morning. Welcome. Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. I have no conflict. Welcome. Good morning. Dr. Daly. Good morning, uh, Matt Daly. I'm a senior investigator at the Institute for Health Research at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, and also an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. I have no conflicts of interest. Welcome and good morning, Dr. Fry. Good morning, Karen Fry. I am a professor of internal medicine at St. Louis University and the clinical director for the St. Louis University Center for Vaccine Development. I do have conflicts, and they include being the St. Louis University site uh, principal investigator for the phase three Moderna COVID vaccine trial and the Janssen COVID vaccine trial. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Cotton. Neil Cotton. I am the clinical director of the Trans Compromise Host Infection at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I am an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I have no conflict. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Our vice chair, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is Grace Lee. I am professor of pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine. And CMO at Stanford Children's Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Dr. Long. Hello, I'm Sarah Long. I'm professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine in pediatric infectious diseases in Philadelphia, and I have no conflict. Welcome. Good morning. Ms. McNally. Good morning. Veronica McNally, president of the Bernie Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflict. Morning, welcome, thank you. Uh, Dr. Paling. Good morning. Kathy Paling, Professor of Pediatrics and Epidemiology and Prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine. I have no conflict. Welcome, good morning. Dr. Sanchez. Good morning, this is Pablo Sanchez. Um, I'm a professor of pediatrics and neonatology and pediatric infectious disease specialist at Nationwide Children's of uh, the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I have, no I have no conflict. Okay. Thank, thank you. Dr. Talbot. Good morning. I'm Tip Talbot. I'm an associate professor of medicine. Uh, I do adult infectious diseases at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so everyone is present here from the ACIP voting members. I will now go on to the ex officio representatives. I will call your organizations. Please uh, state uh, who you are and uh, uh, you're present. Um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good morning. Uh, I'm Melinda Wharton from the Immunization Services Division at CDC. Thank you very much. Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services. Good morning. This is Mary Beth Hand from CMS. Thank you. Welcome. Food and Drug Administration. Good morning, Dorothy, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Vaccines. Welcome. Health Resources and Services Administration. Captain Dale Mishler standing in for Dr. Mary Lucas. Morning, welcome. Indian Health Service. Good morning, Captain Tom Weiser for Indian Health Service. Good morning. National Institutes of Health. Good morning, John Bigel, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIH. Welcome. Office of Infectious Diseases and HIV Aid Policy. Uh, David Kim representing OIDP. Thank you all. 
Um, I will now turn uh, to the uh, liaison representatives, uh, calling uh, each each uh, liaison group. Uh, please state your name and any uh, conflict of interest. Uh, American Academy of Family Physicians. Pamela Rockwell, AAFP, no conflict. Thank you, welcome. American Academy of Pediatrics. Good morning, Bonnie Maldonado, Professor of Global Health and Infectious Diseases, Stanford University, and Chair of the Committee on Infectious Diseases for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you. American Academy of Pediatrics, Red Book. David Kimberlin, University of Alabama at Birmingham, Pediatric Infectious Diseases. I'm editor of the Red Book. Thank you. Welcome. American Academy of Physicians Assistants. Marie Michelle Leger, Director of Clinical Education, American Academy of PAs, No Conflict. Good morning. Welcome. American College of Health Association. Sorry, American College of Health Association. Good morning, Sharon McMullen, Cornell University, and signing in for my colleague, Dr. K.B. Chai, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Neither of us have conflicts. Welcome. American College of Nurse Midwives. American College of, Mer of Nurse Midwives. Okay, passing on to the next group. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Good morning, this is Dr. Linda Eckert. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I am the liaison for ACOG. Thank you. Thank you, welcome. American College of Physicians. Good morning, Dr. Jason Goldman, General Internal Medicine, affiliate professor, Florida Atlantic University, representing the American College of Physicians. Always a pleasure to be here, thank you. Welcome and good morning. American Geriatric Society. Morning, Ken Spader for AGS. Good morning. America's health insurance plans. Uh, yes, this is Bob Buckman, I'm Chief Medical Officer for uh, 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 Providence Health uh, Plans. I do have some minor stock holdings uh, that are unrelated to any votes that may occur today. I'm a non-voting member, but I have minor stock holdings in Abbott, AbbVie, Walgreens, and Crystal Meyer. Okay. Thank you. Um, American Immunization Registry Association. Good morning, Rebecca Coyle representing ERA. Thank you. American Medical Association. Sandra Freyhofer, practicing general internist in Atlanta, an adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory, uh, representing the American Medical Association. Thank you, welcome. American Nurses Association. American Nurses Association. Okay, we'll come back. American Osteopathic Association. Yeah, Stan Grau, Professor Emeritus uh, at Oklahoma State University representing the American Osteopathic Association present, thank you. Thank you, welcome. American F uh, Pharmacists Association. Good morning, this is Steve Foster, I'm here. Good morning. Association of Immunization Managers. Association of, of uh, Immunization Managers. All right, we'll come back. Uh, Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. This is Paul McKinney, Professor of School of Public Health and Information Sciences, University of Louisville. Welcome, thank you. Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. Good morning, Dr. Romero. This is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and also the president of ASTO. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Phyllis Arthur on behalf of Bio. Good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you. Morning. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Okay, we'll come back to you. Um, Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Uh, Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Yes. 
Hi, good morning. It's Althea House representing the National Advisory Committee on Immunization for Canada. Good morning. Infectious Diseases Society of America. Good morning. This is Jeff Duchin, Professor in Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Washington in Seattle and Health Officer for Public Health, Seattle and Clinton County, representing the Infectious Diseases Society of America. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Good morning. International Society for Travel Medicine. Good morning. Elizabeth Barnett on behalf of the ISPL. Good morning. Thank you. National Association of County and City Health Officers or officials, excuse me. Hey, good morning. This is Matt Zahn representing NHO. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Good morning. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Good morning. Patsy Stinchfield from Children's Hospitals and Clinics, Minnesota, Nurse Practitioner in Infectious Disease and Immunology, representing NAPNAP, no conflicts. Thank you. Welcome. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Uh, this is Bill Schaffner. Professor of Preventive Medicine and Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt and Medical Director of the NFID. No conflicts. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Welcome. National Medical Association. Good morning. Patricia Whitley Williams, Professor in Chief of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Rutgers Robert Johnson Medical School, representing the National Medical Association. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Yeah, this is Sean O'Leary, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado in Children's Hospital, Colorado, uh, representing the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Welcome. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning. Corey Robertson, present. Thank you. Welcome. Society for Adolescent Medicine, I'm uh, sorry, Adolescent Health and Medicine. Hi, it's Amy Middleman. Good morning. I'm representing Sam today. Welcome. Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of, Amer of uh, America. Good morning. This is Marcy Dries, Chief Infection Prevention Officer and Household Epidemiologist at Christian Care and Associate Professor of Medicine at Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. And I have no conflict. Uh, representing Shay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I will go back um, to those who did not respond. Uh, so, uh, American College of Nurse Midwives. All right, one more time, American College of Nurse Midwives. Okay. Uh, American Nurses Association. Good morning. This is Chad Riddle uh, representing the ANA. Good morning. Welcome. The um, Association of Immunization Managers. Association of Immunization Managers. Okay, moving on. Um, Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. So apparently, uh, uh, Susan Lett, Ms. Lett, Dr. Lett is, uh, is on the line, uh, but we're not able to hear her. So uh, we'll mark her as present. Um, very good. So that completes our roll call. Um, uh, let me see here. We'll move on then, I think, to our first topic, um, which is uh, coronavirus disease uh, 2019 vaccines with an introduction by the uh, COVID-19 workgroup chair, uh, Dr. Bell. Dr. Bell, are you ready? Yes, uh, Dr. Romero, here I am. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good morning to everyone. Could I have the uh, next slide, please? Um, so um, it wasn't very long ago that we last met, and so I, um, I'm just going to spend a minute or two going through some of the details of um, what um, the uh, what we've been up to um, before the last emergency meeting and since then. So um, during the week of April 12th, as um, many of you are already aware, um, on Monday um, there was a meeting of the Vaccine Safety Technical Group. Um, followed on Tuesday by a joint CDC FDA statement, which recommended a pause in um, the use of the um, J&J &J vaccine and a health alert network 
notification was released. Uh, also on Tuesday, um, the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group met. And on Wednesday, uh, April 14th, there was an emergency ACIP meeting. Now this emergency meeting um, ha was uh, meant to consider the implications of reported cases of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia after um, the, the uh, Janssen j, j vaccine on vaccination policy. And after discussions regarding the U.S. cases of uh, central venous uh, sinus thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, the ACIP agreed that more information was needed before policy recommendations could be made regarding um, the Janssen vaccine. Next, please. So during the week of April 19th, uh, on Monday, the um, VAST met again. Um, on Wednesday, um, there was a, an additional a special meeting of the ACIP COVID-19 vaccine work group. And on Thursday was an addition of the, a second uh, meeting of the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group. Um, today, we are uh, meeting again in emergency ACIP session. And uh, the purpose of this meeting is to review um, the updated uh, cases of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia after the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine to discuss uh, the risk benefits, benefit analysis uh, and uh, policy options for updated uh, recommendations for use of this vaccine. Next. Today's agenda, um, I'll just go over that very briefly. Um, first, we're going to uh, hear from Dr. Michael Streif um, from the John Hop Johns Hopkins University, um, who um, will uh, present uh, about the pathogenesis and management of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Um, and then Dr. Tom Sharon from CDC will uh, talk about um, the thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, TTS, following the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. We will have a public comment period. Then we will hear from the manufacturers um, of uh, the Janssen vaccine, Dr. Matai Maman, who is the director of a, the global uh, head for Janssen Research and Development, and Dr. Joanne Waldstreicher, who is the chief medical officer of J&J. &J. Dr. Grace Lee, um, the uh, co-chair of VAST and ACIP uh, member, will um, give the VAST assessment. Um, then we will hear from Dr. Oliver, um, with uh, a presentation about um, applying the evidence to recommendation framework um, to um, the TTS after COVID-19, um, the typographical error there, vaccines. We will have a discuss discussion period and then a vote um, on uh, updated interim recommendations for use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Next. Again, um, I uh, just want to um, acknowledge all of the uh, work group members, ex officios, liaisons, consultants, um, and uh, the CDC lead, uh, Dr. Sarah Oliver. Um, next. As well as um, the large number of CDC participants um, who have uh, been working um, very hard uh, to put together um, the uh, information that we will be hearing today. Uh, thank you. I think that's it for me. And I'll uh, turn the uh, gavel back to you, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Bell. So we'll move on to um, our next presentation, which is the pathogenesis and management of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, TTS. Um, and um, we will ask uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Streif um, to please uh, go forward. And forgive me if oh, I mispronounce you. your name. Oh, no, you did fine. <laughs> and hey, um, this is Mike Strife, and I appreciate the invitation to present today. Um, next slide. So this is just for your review uh, disclosures. I have done some consulting for uh, these companies, uh, specifically on development of anticoagulant medications and for coagulation testing, um, as well as some research support from uh, uh, the funders you see on the slide. Uh, next slide. So I thought first, 
before we get into the uh, the TTS syndrome that I discuss a little bit about cerebral venous sinus thrombosis because it's an unusual thrombotic event that um, uh, compared to what we usually see in uh, clinical practice, which much more common events would be deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. But it's similar in the fact that it's a thrombotic event that occurs in the deep veins or superficial veins of the brain, as you can see in this uh, nice picture there. Um, the incidence, it's quite a rare um, uh, event that there are about 10 to 15 cases per million in the population. So this is far rarer than when with deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, we see one in a thousand in the general population on an annual basis. The mean age for patients uh, with this is about 35 years of age, so a younger patient population than typical for other venous events. And it tends to occur more frequently in women than men by about a two to one ratio. Typical presentation for patients is a headache. Vast majority of patients have a headache. Uh, more severely affected patients can have seizures related to the injury, uh, limb weakness, or reduced level of consciousness, or even coma. Um, risk factors for CVST in the general population are use of estrogen-containing oral contraceptives, uh, clotting disorders, uh, pregnancy, cancers, particularly of the central venous, uh, central nervous system, or infections of that location, or surgeries, particularly of that uh, location. Uh, generally, the diagnosis is made with either a contrast CT scan of the brain or of the uh, or magnetic resonance imaging, focusing on the veins. And treatment generally is anticoagulation. In extreme cases, uh, thrombolysis or clot-busting medications or devices will be used. Next slide. So what are the clinical characteristics of the uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome so far? And, I, and this is, I'd say, a, a moving target because we're still early in the acquisition of cases. But so far, it appears to be a uh, thrombotic response to uh, receiving uh, an adenoviral vector vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the, the incidence, and this is based on the European experience, and the United Kingdom experience is anywhere from one case per 100,000 to one in 250,000 of vaccine recipients. This is a moving target still being, you know, with this, I wouldn't consider this gospel or accurate data. Uh, age range, very broad, anywhere from uh, 20s to uh, as old as 77 years of age, although the vast majority of patients have been less than 60 years of age. Generally affects women more than men. Um, Immediate onset of the symptoms after vaccination is about nine to 10 days. This is looking at the European and UK data with the range up to 24 days after vaccination. Uh, the most common thrombotic events are cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, although some patients have also had DVT or PE. A couple of patients have presented with just deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism and not CVST. There have also been abdominal vein blood clots, and some patients have had arterial thrombotic events. What's unique about this um, compared to other thrombotic events is that these patients tend to have positive tests for an entity known as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is a reasonably infrequent adverse event to receiving particularly unfractionated heparin therapy. Um, and when this testing has been done on the patients that have been reported so far, they seem to be uniformly positive for the platelet factor four heparin antibody immunoassay. And this is in particular an ELISA assay. Some of the other immunoassays have been negative, rarely, although we have a, a small experience, I emphasize. And platelet activation assays that are typically used for diagnosing this entity um, have been positive in some cases, although you'll see in the U.S. cases, not uniformly positive. Um, play the nadirs um, generally in the uh, 20,000 range, as you can see the range there, any, anywhere from 7 to 113,000. Fibrinogen values tend to be low. Um, normal range for fibrinogen is usually 200 to 250 to 400 to 450 milligrams per deciliter. Some patients, a rare patient had an elevated 
fibrinogen, but most patients tend to be normal or low. Uh, D-dimer levels tend to be markedly elevated, uh, reflecting a thrombotic process. And these patients clinically, when they've been treated with unfractionated heparin uh, upon presentation, they've had progression of their thrombotic events. And then platelet recovery tends to occur with use of a non-heparin anticoagulant as well as intravenous immunoglobulin. Next slide. So this is just a, a brief comparison of the two vaccines and the characteristics. And as you can see, comparing one side to the other, the age range is similar between the two vaccines, although there have been many more cases with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. The uh, number of cases, we've, uh, as far as gender distribution, more frequent with women than men. Um, uh, and the onset about the same, that anywhere from five days to up to a few, you know, three weeks or so. Presentations have been similar since most patients are presenting with a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Headache is prominent, although abdominal pain, back pain is also prominent, and then signs of stroke, so leg or arm weakness or disturbances in consciousness. Um, thrombotic events, as you can see, have been sim in similar locations, as have platelet nadirs. Um, the heparin platelet factor 4 assay, the immunoassay, that is the ELISA assay, has been uniformly positive. Uh, platelet function as or functional platelet activation assays have been, in the European experience, positive, less positive in the U.S. experience using a different assay, the serotonin release assay. Next slide. So this is uh, a cartoon that um, attempts to show how we think this, or what's going on in this syndrome? How, is this, how are these thrombotic events developing? Why do these patients have thrombocytopenia? And this is based on the uh, published work so far, primarily from Europe, Greinacher, as well as Schultz, but primarily Andreas Greinacher, who spent his whole career studying heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And so a lot of this understanding of what heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is, is based on his work. What you can see in this cartoon, is you see first on the uh, uh, left side of the cartoon, you have a platelet with an alpha granule. Inside alpha granules is a protein called platelet factor 4, also shown as PF4. And that is a chemokine that's important for controlling, uh, it's, I, I guess, a suppressor of endogenous anticoagulants like heparan sulfate, also is involved in the uh, wound healing um, process. So in patients that have a lot of activation of platelet of platelets, you'll release a lot of platelet factor four to help in the thrombotic and healing process. If someone has been exposed to a polyanion, such as unfractionated heparin, these complexes of platelet factor four and heparin can form, as you see in the uh, top end of this diagram. And then this, what this does is converts platelet factor four, a portion of it, into an immunogen that, it's, that the immune system responds to in a small percentage of patients. And so what happens is they develop antibodies against this neoantigen on platelet factor four that's generated by the interaction between the polyanion heparin and platelet factor four. And then these antibodies can bind to the FC receptors on platelets. And then what this results in is profound platelet activation. And so you get consumptive thrombocytopenia in the situation where platelets are being activated and form lots of platelet microparticles, as you can see toward the bottom right-hand side of the slide, where there's lots of these little platelet microparticles that increase the surface area of platelets. And also because they're activated, they have a lot of phosphatidylserine exposed, which serves as kind of a playground for the, the clotting factors and activates the coagulation cascade. And so what you generate is uh, a vicious cycle, a uh, thrombotic storm that consumes more platelets, activates more platelets, and causes clotting. Uh, next slide. Platelets, now this is a beautiful diagram that's horribly complex, but I couldn't find a better one in the literature um, that kind of outlines that it's not just platelets that are activated by um, antibodies that are involved in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, the endothelium is activated. It expresses tissue factor. It's also injured, releasing von Willebrand factor that can cause platelets to aggregate. Monocytes, uh, one of the white cells are activated and they express tissue factor as well. Again, that activates the coagulation cascade. And then finally, neutrophils are activated 
and express, uh, express these in their activation on nets or neutrophil extracellular traps that again form a place where you can activate, activate platelets, you can activate the, co uh, the coagulation cascade. Now, what I've discussed so far focuses completely on heparin because that's the most common trigger for the syndrome. But there's a small, a variant of it that a small number of patients have been reported that develop something called autoimmune thrombocytopenic purpura, which is where the patients have not received heparin at all, and yet they develop the syndrome. And this has been seen in people that have had surgery, and um, it's thought that endogenous polyanions like heparan sulfate or chondroitin sulfate or even DNA RNA complexes can bind to platelet factor four and generate these antibodies. And this is what is thought to be the pathogenesis that we're seeing with the vaccine based on primarily on Andreas Greinacher studies that are published in the New England Journal. Next slide. And so this is kind of the data that, uh, I, you know, kind of a compilation of the data that supports the current, you know, uh, I guess, concept of what is causing this syndrome, that it appears to be based on laboratory testing and clinical presentation, similar to a case of autoimmune heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, because none of these patients have been exposed to heparin, yet they develop a syndrome that looks very much like it. Uh, what supports that? Well, the laboratory testing is consistent with autoimmune hit, that if you they have pl positive platelet factor four immunoassays, and certainly in Greinacher's lab with his platelet activation assay, they are also uniformly positive. If you add platelet factor four to, these, to the reaction mixture, it amplifies the reaction, which is typical of autoimmune hit. You can also inhibit platelet activation in vitro with either high concentrations of heparin that bind or that block the formation of the uh, multimolecular complexes that activate platelets, or you can block it also with intravenous immunoglobulin, which is why it's used for the treatment of this syndrome. The clinical course also uh, mirrors it, that they, uh, it's very typical of autoimmune thrombocytopenia, where patients come in with thrombocytopenia and a thrombotic episode that is resistant and acts, actually is, pro, you know, is promoted by heparin treatment. Um, and it improves when you use a non-heparin anticoagulant as well as an intravenous immunoglobulin. Now, the etiology of this is still very unknown, I would say. It's unclear. Um, Dr. Greinacher has published something that's on uh, Research Square, not yet peer-reviewed, where he looked at patients that had uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and did analysis of platelet factor IV structure as well as the spike protein, could not find um, any patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection that had platelet activating antibodies. So he doesn't think, based on his research, that there's, that there's molecular mimicry like we see with uh, HIV and ITP. They, we don't have any data for that. So I think still it's, un, it's unclear what causes this to develop. Next slide. So the management, uh, and this is based largely on the, uh, the ASH guidelines, although ISTH and uh, anticoagulation form also have rep recommendations in this regard. Uh, that for clinicians, we need to maintain a high index of suspicion that if anyone presents with any thrombotic event associated with thrombocytopenia, we, ha uh, we have to consider this syndrome. Then you have to confirm the thrombotic event with imaging, and then send, at the same time, you're simultaneously testing for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with a platelet factor four immunoassay, and then following that, those positive test results up with an activation of functional assay. Uh, of course, you should cons uh, the, uh, physicians should consult a hematologist so they can confirm the diagnosis. Also rule out other diagnoses that can present similar to, to uh, this thrombocytopenia thrombotic syndrome. And then treat with a non-heparin anticoagulant and then treat the thrombocytopenia with intravenous immunoglobulin, which blocks antibody activation of platelets um, and speeds recovery of platelets. And avoid platelet transfusions because that seems to feed the fire of this syndrome. Next slide. So with that, it kind of concludes my remarks. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation again. Thank you very much for that outstanding review. Um, we are now open for questions.
looking for hands. Just a minute. Dr. Lee, please. Uh, thank you so much for that um, excellent presentation. I wanted to ask about um, uh, your comment about, well, in, in some reports, some have noted that the depth of thrombocytopenia might be associated with worse outcome. Um, so I guess my question is, does that reflect how long the process has been going on? And is it possible that if IVIG were administered early, that could um, impact the overall outcome of patients? So very good question. I would say that the depth of thrombocytopenia could suggest that the process has been going on ongoing longer or should have some maybe reflects the, the, uh, the titer of antibodies, the immune reaction that's been triggered. It uh, could be either one of those things. Uh, and I think that in those patients, we, you, you really do need to use intravenous immunoglobulin. We don't always use IVIG for typical heparin-induced thrombocytopenia patient treatment, but we do use it in people that have severe syndromes. And these patients seem to have a very severe clinical presentation. And so I think IVIG is, is, should be used if it's available for their treatment. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. That was um, a very nice explanation. I was just wondering, um, because the role of EDTA, at least in one in the AstraZeneca vaccine, has also been implicated to cause some vascular permeability. And I was wondering where that may fit in into all of this, um, looking at other constituents of the vaccine. You know, I have no idea. I, you know, I can't see how that might um, trigger the antigen unless it's causing um, release of, you know, uh, there is heparin sulfate, dermatin sulfate bound to the endothelium. If there's something, if the vaccine is triggering release of those compounds in higher proportions so that they can bind to platelet factor four, and the vaccine is also activating platelets, you might, I can see you, but that's, I'm doing a lot of hand waving. You can't see it, but that's what's happening. But uh, so uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that still uh, remains to be seen and tested as a hypothesis. Thank you. Sure. Sorry to have a better answer. Um, Dr. Bernstein. Fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you, you listed six risk factors associated with TTS. Um, would screening for those risk factors eliminate uh, those people getting uh, getting this vaccine and therefore decrease the uh, incidence of TTS after vaccine? Unfortunately, I don't think so. That the, if you uh, basically, I'm reporting. I reported like comorbid uh, conditions or treatments that those pa that some patients that have been reported have had. But we've also had patients that were not taking oral contraceptives or hormonal therapy, were not obese, you know, that, um, and there's no, you know, a, a patient or two have had thrombophilic or clotting states, but the vast majority have not had those, the, any of those associations. So I think it's, uh, the, I guess, the major uh, way we could focus on patients like uh, on who are at risk, or it seems like it's a... It affects people that are younger in age and seems to affect women more than men um, so far. But I don't think we can just focus on oral contraceptive users or uh, obese patients and, uh, and as far as for vaccine, to exclude them from vaccine, you know, uh, getting the J&J &J vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. I, I don't think we can do that. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Daly. Um, thanks for that excellent presentation. Um, to, to, to what extent do you think treatment is improving outcomes or sort of what's on the horizon in terms of treatment? Thank you. Um, so I think that um, recognition that this syndrome exists is helping to improve outcomes. I think that recognition among physicians, also recognition in the public that if you develop a severe headache, um, severe abdominal pain, 
that you really need to see your doctor and, and see someone for further evaluation. And I think those two pieces, I think, will improve outcomes because it's clear that at least in some of the cases where people, the, the published cases, they tried to treat their symptoms at home for a number of days before they presented. And when they presented, they were severely ill. So I think that early presentation by education of public and physicians will improve outcomes. As far as other medications, I think right now we're stuck with what we have. Although I think educating doctors to avoid heparin therapy in these patients will improve outcomes. That's, that's another thing that'll improve outcomes and using a non-heparin anticoagulant and thinking about intravenous immunoglobulin early, particularly in someone that's severely affected, that will help improve outcomes. So I think with education, we can improve outcomes of these patients. Thank you. Before I turn to the liaison members, are there any more questions from the voting work, from the voting ACIP members? Dr. Romero, this is Sarah Long. I don't seem to be able to get my hand raised here to work. Please, please go ahead, Dr. Long. Of course, yes. please. Um, you quoted a number uh, for the occurrence of uh, cerebral venous uh, sinus thrombosis of 1 in 10 to 15 million cases. Uh, 10 to 15. Oh, so, yeah, so 1 in 100,000, yeah. Um, that was with vaccine. I'm really talking about the, if, if we're talking about what the population range of uh, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis is, um, was that without thrombocytopenia? And do you have any clue that what the number might be without vaccine for um, TTS? Very good question. So um, in the first slide, I quoted, you know, uh, the published studies suggest that the incidence of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is about one in 100,000, <coughs> or it's 10 per million, uh, roughly. Um, and, but as far as people presenting with thrombocytopenia, that is extraordinarily rare in my experience. And I have not seen that reported in published literature for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, they, that generally is not a feature of it. Um, so the thrombocytopenia in association with these clotting events is, is unique. Um, I couldn't give you a number on how many people with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis have thrombocytopenia on presentation. I can just tell you from my experience, treating these patients, I've just never seen it. it it's just not, it, you typically have a clot and the platelets are in the normal range. Um, the incidence with the, uh, the vaccines is based on estimates I saw in one of the, uh, from one of the editorials that had looked at the number of vaccines delivered, and this is European data, number of vaccines delivered in Europe and UK, and they estimated between one in 100,000 and one in 250,000 vaccinated patients. Um, Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, just a, a note, Dr. Oliver has some uh, uh, numbers that we'll, she'll share later that might clarify that question a little bit more. Uh, Dr. That's Long, right. did you have additional questions? No. Very good. Um, anyone Dr. else from Romero? the... Yes, who is this? This is Kathy Bailey. Yes, are you having problems? All oh, there you are, I see you. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, so... Dr. Strife, thank you very much for a very informative um, presentation. Um, if I understand correctly, the, um, there's a female predominance for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis um, in its traditional presentation. There's a female predominance for the thrombocytosis um, and thrombocytopenia associated with adenoviruses. Now, when we get to the autoimmune um, form of this syndrome with heparin or other, is there a female predominance for that as well? Um, so for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, there uh, generally you know, not a particular predominance between men and women, maybe slightly more women than men, but not, not you know, there's not a dramatic 
difference as far as for expo you know developing heparin induced thrombocytopenia. As far as for autoimmune hit, um, it's a it's a rare bird. So as far as so we don't have I don't have a good idea as to what the uh, the gender breakdown is for autoimmune hit, which is a much less common form of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, is, are you, is your hand up again, or uh, is that a leftover? Leftovers, my apologies. No, no, that's, that's fine. I'm just making sure. Um, uh, Ms. Stinchfield. Yes, thank Stinchfield. you, Dr. Street. Very helpful presentation. To your point about uh, clinicians thinking about using IVIG early, do you have any information about our IVIG supply in the U.S. right now? You know, over the years, we've had uh, times where we were quite low in ability to, to get and use IVIG. Any information on that? Unfortunately, I do not. I, I don't have that. And if I guess if clinicians do not have availability of IVIG in their location, I would start a non-heparin anticoagulants, um, typical, which is typical of what we used to do what we've done for years with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and see if they couldn't order some as early as possible or get them to a medical center where they might be able to get it. Um, but I don't, I don't have an idea what our supply is for IVIG, no. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dushin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, is there a difference in either severity of the syndrome or clinical outcomes, can you say, uh, between cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with and without uh, thrombosis with uh, thrombocytopenia syndrome? Um, it's uh, as far as, so I think uh, just to clarify your question, you mean, is there a difference in outcomes between people that develop this TTS syndrome versus the typical cerebral venous sinus thrombosis? Yes. Uh, I think that it, it seems like these patients that develop TTS have a more severe, um, uh, their outcomes are worse. But that may be due to the fact that um, initially some of these patients have been treated with heparin, which may promote further, uh, they promote for progression. So that's a, uh, you know, an added wrinkle that may make it so that they don't get the right anticoagulant treatment and they don't get the IVIG in as timely a fashion because you don't have to worry about that with CVST, you just treat them with heparin. There's a, it, you, so they'll get treatment right away. So I think so far the outcomes tend to, have tended to be worse, but that may be because the treatment is more, you have to have this specific treatment. Um, and again, education may help with that. I, you know, I think getting people present earlier and then doctors implementing the right management strategy may may reduce you know may make their outcomes more closely parallel you know more closely parallel typical CVST patients thank you sure uh, dr sanchez yeah i had another question so are you so you're saying that those who present with um, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in general don't present initially with thrombocytopenia yes okay because there's animal study in mice where adenovirus um, associated thrombosis has been initially seen with, uh, you know, they do cause thrombocytopenia. So in trying to delineate what it is in these vaccines, um, you know, the something about the vector may be, um, you know, I'm just speculating, but, um, but there have been, you know, some, um, adenovirus induced thrombocytopenia that's been seen in, in mice. And so, um, you know, so which makes it then different than what has been seen with the, with the non vaccine associated um, cerebral venous thrombosis. I, I think you, you're right. That is a, a you know, a very, um, uh, it's, a hypothesis that may be why there's differences between typical cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and this TTS uh, syndrome. That, um, but I, I I don't know of any data that's that uh, we have that that's that the the vaccine is activating platelets and then somehow 
there's a endogenous polyanion that's forming these these platelet factor four antibodies, but it could be, and that could be why it's different. Um, uh, I think that's probably being explored by many investigators. So, mm-hmm. but there's got to be something different about it compared to your, our typical T- CVST patient. Well, thank you. I, I agree. No, I mean, no, it's fascinating. That, I think a great idea. We really need that information. <laughs> yep. No, I agree. That's a great. That's a great idea. So um, let me let me offer some comment here and be careful when a pediatric infectious disease uh, specialist offers comment on, on a hematologic condition. But my understanding from reading the literature um, from the German group is that um, not all of the vaccine um, enters the cell, and some of the, some of it spills over into the bloodstream. And then breaking down in the bloodstream, it's the DNA contained within the adenovirus that that sets up the anion. Um, and and then attracts the the platelets. So, I mean that that's the theory that I have, and, and I don't know if that's if that answers your question, Pablo. But I would just throw that out. Um, so, uh, Dr. Long. Yeah. No, I think that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I did see that. The dry doctor has said that has said that's another possible avenue. Thank you. To these antibodies. Yes, you're correct. Thank you, Dr. Long. Yes, I found my little, my hand raiser, so now you're all in trouble. I I wondered if you might also uh, give an opinion on the relative outcomes of patients who have the the true heparin-induced syndrome uh, appropriately treated uh, compared with the vaccine-induced TTS, or what we presume is vaccine-induced TTS. Um, good question. I, generally, patients with the heparin-induced, the typical heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, I think have better outcomes than we're seeing with the TTS. And I think that the primary reason for that is the location of the clot that um, I can't think of a patient that I've managed with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia where they've developed cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And typically, they develop deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or an arterial clot. But having clots in the CNS and then uh, secondary intracranial hemorrhage, it's just a bad place to have a clot. And so that's why I think the fatality rate of this syndrome uh, or the rate of people having uh, permanent neurologic or at least ongoing neurologic um, problems is much higher than we see with typical HIT patients because they're not clotting in their brain. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gluckman. Sorry, it took me a while to get unmuted. Um, Can you give us some sense of which actually the incidence of uh, 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 thrombotic events with complications that are actually secondary to COVID and how that compares to uh, the complications related to the uh, 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 vaccines. Yeah, so I'll I'll give you what, this may be in other talks too. Um, I'm just, um, there has, there is an article out, I don't know if it's in Research Square, I saw a, a preprint of an article that, from Oxford, I believe, that looked at specifically cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in patients that had COVID. And this is all based on administrative data, so observational data. Um, We don't have data that they had this syndrome, uh, the patients with COVID. But that cerebral venous sinus thrombosis um, appeared to be about tenfold more common than we're seeing it in the patients that are getting the vaccine-associated cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Um, So, and I had not heard that before. This is, I think, a brand new analysis that was done with administrative data because of this vaccine associated syndrome that is developed. So, um, and of course we know from all the published reports on COVID, there is uh, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism is not an uncommon event in critically ill patients with COVID that uh, 5% to 10% 10% of critically ill patients will develop a DVT or pulmonary embolism during their COVID infection. Dr. Shaw. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. This is Nirav Shah from the State of Maine CDC. Dr. Stray, thank you for your excellent presentation. I, I am trying to get a better understanding of the age dimension uh, to, to this phenomenon. I noted on your slide five that among the AstraZeneca recipients, the median age uh, was 40, which strikes me as roughly the median age of the background population. But among J&J &J recipients, the range was from teens to those in their 50s, suggesting a much lower median age. Uh, two questions, is there a biological basis to believe there is an age component to this? And then secondly, to the extent there are differences with those two vaccines, could the lower age among the J&J &J recipients be merely a function of the way in which vaccines were rolled out in the US? That is to say, older individuals perhaps received an mRNA vaccine earlier in the vaccination effort, and it's just now where younger folks are getting J&J vaccine. So it's an excellent point. Um, I'm not certain. I think, it, I think we're still in the uh, data acquisition phase. So we haven't had that many cases. And so these numbers may change. The uh, numbers uh, that at least the pub, those are the published cases on the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, they've had a lot more time to accumulate cases and we're still very early in the process of examining J&J examining &J cases. Um, I would also say that the, uh, the higher age range that the, um, some of those older patients from the UK experience, they seem to be a little different than the patients that were reported by the German Austrian group and the uh, uh, the uh, Swedish group. And so I just uh, wary whether we may have accumulated some, a couple of patients that may actually not have had the syndrome because there were some people in the UK experience that had pulmonary embolism uh, and didn't have cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or the abdominal thrombotic events. And HIT testing is a, um, uh, particularly the functional assays are very challenging. Um, and so I think it's, uh, I think we, I, I, can't, I can't confirm whether there's differences in the vaccines and that's why the age range is a little older with the AstraZeneca versus the Johnson Johnson. I just, I think our data are too preliminary. And maybe Sarah or uh, Tom will have more data than I have. Cause I think they have a, do a closer analysis of, our, of the US cases than I've done. I've done a very thumbnail sketch of them. So I don't want to mislead you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. And yes, uh, Dr. Oliver will present more data on that. Um, Dr. Lee, your hand is up again. Um, yes, I have a basic question to ask, which is um, if you could explain to me the, um, you know, perhaps why the functional assays in the U.S. cases were different from the European cases. Is that a matter of a different assay being performed? Um, and uh, if, uh, if whether or not that's the case, I, I guess my question is, if the assay is negative, um, does that mean platelets are activated in that instance? That's an excellent question, Dr. Lee. Um, yeah, so, that, so um, functional HIT assays, I think are a very challenging, they're a very challenging test to do. And so that's why you have very few labs doing functional HIT assays. I think there's a handful of labs in the U.S that do the, the serotonin release assay, which is the functional assay that was used in the US cases uh, predominantly. And that assay, the, uh, let's say the reliability of it, I think varies depending on the expertise of the lab doing the tests. Um, in the European cases, um, they use several different assays. Uh, Andreas Greinacher used his homegrown platelet activation assay that he's been doing since 1990. And so he is literally the world's expert on doing that assay and has, ex has more experience with that assay than anybody else. And so I, I tend to place a lot of faith in his, his functional HIT testing. Um, the, uh, Europe, uh, the UK uh, uh, paper used a, uh, a flow assay and there have not been lots of papers comparing these different functional assays and their reliability, their sensitivity and specificity, et cetera. So I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, premature to say that the functional assays that were, results we're getting in the US, um, that those patients didn't have platelet activation. Uh, I just worry about the, the reliability of the assay because it's such a difficult test to do. 
And when you have a lab like Andreas Granacher's that getting it consistently, it just, he's just such an expert. I think that I put more weight in his, his assay. So I think for our testing, um, as a clinician, what I'm going to be putting my weight on is, you know, I'm, and my, uh, the emphasis on diagnosis is going to be the clinical situation, the, the clinical uh, presentation of the patients, the thrombocytopenia, and then if they have a positive ELISA assay, which seems to be very sensitive for this, since I think all the ELISA tests have been positive in these patients, that's going to be what tells me this person has TTS and we need to treat them like that. And um, if, I got, if I get a negative functional assay back, I'm not going to stop treating them like they have TTS. That, at least that's my take right now. And this, of course, is, a, again, a moving target. It's going to change, I think, as we get more experience. Because we're only talking about five functional assays that have been done so far, I think, in the U.S. on our patients. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Dr. Shaw, your hand is up. Is that still residual from your first? Thank you. My fault. No, it's fine. Um, anyone else? I don't want to close discussion before everyone's had a chance. Very good. Again, thank you very much for that presentation and for your uh, answers to all the questions uh, that we posed to you. Thank you again. Um, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Shimabakuro, who will talk about thrombosis and thrombo, uh, penia, thrombocytopenia syndrome, TTS, following Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, Dr. Shimabakuro, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romero. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, I'll be covering some, uh, some background, which will include um, just refamiliarization with some of the material that was covered at the last ACIP meeting and some of the data that led up to that meeting. And then I'm going to discuss thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome or TTS following Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. And then I'll summarize my findings. Next slide. Next slide. So I mentioned thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. So I do want to cover some basics. And thrombosis occurs when blood clots block blood vessels. And thromboses can be venous or arterial. And common complications can include heart attack, stroke, and infarctions. Causes and risk factors include trauma, immobility, and head inherited disorders, certain auto autoimmune disease, obesity, hormone therapy or, or birth control pills, pregnancy, smoking, cancer, and old age, just, just older age, just to name some. Um, symptoms include pain and swelling in an extremity, chest pain, numbness or weakness on one side of the body, and sudden change in mental status. Um, thromboses are diagnosed primarily through imaging and blood tests. Next slide. So I mentioned thrombosis. Now I want to talk about platelets and thrombocytopenia. So platelets, which are also called thrombocytes, are colorless blood cells that help blood clot. A normal platelet count is 150,000 to 450,000 per microliter. And uh, in the healthcare world, that's usually shorthanded 150 to 450. Platelets stop bleeding by clumping and forming plugs and blood vessel injuries. Thrombocytopenia is a, is a condition in which you have low, a low platelet count, meaning below 150,000 per microliter. Dangerous internal bleeding can occur when your platelet count falls below 10,000. Though rare, severe thrombocytopenia can cause bleeding into the brain, which can be fatal. Next slide. So um, j just to provide some context around uh, the vaccine safety issue that we are discussing, um, this issue first came to attention um, because of the rare um, blood clots with low platelets that were detected following the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and, and many of these events involved uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which Dr. Streif uh, described um, quite well in his excellent presentation. Next slide. So this is a screenshot of the presentation at the last ACIP meeting where we focused on reports of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with thrombocytopenia after the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. 
and I'm not going to cover this because Dr. Streif covered in detail the, the anatomy and the actual condition. Next slide. So this was some of the basic surveillance data that was presented at the last ACIP meeting on April 14th. And at that time, we had had six reports of CVST with thrombocytopenia following 6.86 million doses administered of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. That translated to a reporting rate of 0.87 cases per million doses administered. In contrast, there were zero reports following 97.9 million Pfizer-BioNTech doses administered and three reports following 84.7 million Moderna COVID-19 vaccine doses administered. However, all those three reports had normal platelet counts. So this was essentially zero reports following 180 million doses, just over 180 million doses of the mRNA vaccines. And we'd considered this a reporting rate imbalance. Next slide. So the take home message at that time was that CVST is rare but clinically serious and can result in substantial morbidity and mortality. It's usually not associated with thrombocytopenia. We did an observe versus, versus expected analysis, um, which was a bit of an apples and oranges comparison because our expected was based on CVST. We don't really have good information, as Dr. Strife pointed out, on the background incidence of CVST with thrombocytopenia. It's extremely rare. Um, the reports were in women uh, age 18 to 48, all with thrombocytopenia. So these were younger women. And there was no obvious patterns of risk factors detected. Again, by contrast, CVST with thrombocytopenia had not been observed after the two authorized mRNA vaccines. The clinical features of the Janssen cases were similar to those observed following the AstraZeneca COVID-19, similar to those observed following the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine in Europe. And both uh, the Janssen and the AstraZeneca vaccines contain replication and competent adenoviral vectors. Next slide. So based on the information, actually prior to the ACIP meeting, um, CDC issued a HAN. Um, and uh, the, the, the bottom line in that Han was um, that, that CDC and FDA recommended a pause um, in the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine out of an abundance of caution while further assessment of the signal um, could occur. Um, and an important message to healthcare providers was that they should be aware of these potential adverse events and, and <clears throat> so they can provide proper management due to the unique treatment requirement of this type of blood clot, which is um, not giving heparin um, if the HIT uh, test is positive, treating with uh, other non-heparin anticoagulants. Next slide. So after we detected this safety signal in our VAR system, we turned to our vaccine safety data link system, our population-based system, um, to, 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 to look, see what kind of data we had on this rare condition, CVST. Um, and our initial focus was on looking at uh, the, the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines, and I will present data on the Janssen vaccines. But as of April 17th, there were 2.7 million doses of Pfizer, BioNTech, and 2.5 million doses of Moderna COVID-19 vaccines administered in VSD. So a substantial amount of, of the mRNA vaccines administered in the VSD. There were 10 total cases of CVST identified following the mRNA vaccines. Five of these cases ruled out. They were either historical cases or had a history of head injury, and one had a history of chronic cavernous sinus syndrome. There were five cases that were potentially CVST, but all without thrombocytopenia. So after this initial VS or the supplementary VSD analysis for mRNA vaccines, there were no confirmed cases after 5.2 million doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines administered in the VSD. Next slide. So um, our, our assessment at that time is that we had a safety signal detected for CVST with thrombocytopenia following the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Six cases observed in women 18 to 48 years in early post-authorization monitoring 
I'll mention there was one case observed in the pre-authorization clinical trials in a 25-year-old male. And currently there is a lack of evidence of an association between mRNA COVID-19 vaccines and CVST with thrombocytopenia. Next slide. I wanna mention that the Brighton collaboration has a draft case finding definition for a, a condition which is, which is called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, which is broader than just CVST with thrombocytopenia, includes other clots. Um, a hallmark of their draft case definition is that you need to be thrombocytopenic, so a platelet count less than 150. And in addition to rare thromboses, it, it includes more common thromboses such as deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary thromboembolism, ischemic stroke, and myocardial infarction. Next slide. Now I'll move on to the data sources and the TTS cases that we have detected and assessed. Next slide. Our main source uh, of cases are is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is the nation's early warning system for vaccine safety. It is a spontaneous reporting system or a passive surveillance system that's co-administered by CDC and FDA. Um, Bears accepts reports from anyone, so patients, parents, caregivers, healthcare providers, and vaccine manufacturers. Um, as a as a national system, um, it, it 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 has a large population. Uh, potentially under surveillance. It's good at detecting rare adverse events and rapidly detecting safety signals. It's subject to the limitations of passive surveillance in general, and it is not designed to assess causality. Next slide. I wanna mention that in addition to uh, our VARES system and our VARES team of, of reviewers and abstractors, we also relied on our clinical immunization safety assessment project team and our consultants at our CISA sites to help review and evaluate these cases. Next slide. So case finding for TTS following Janssen COVID-19 vaccine occurs in a, in a variety of ways. Um, often healthcare providers will directly contact CDC with potential TTS cases as they come into the hospital or as they're hospitalized. Um, CDC initiates an investigation and fa facilitates submission of a VAERS report if it hasn't already been reported to VAERS. Also, FDA physicians review incoming VAERS reports daily to identify potential TTS cases. We also search the VAERS database for possible TTS reports. And this includes MEDRA PTs, a search for MEDRA, um, that's the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities, which is a standardized coding. Um, that's used um, uh, for regulatory purposes. Um, we, we do a MEDRA PT preferred term search for large vessel thrombosis and or embolism, any report. We don't restrict it to reports that have MEDRA PTs for thrombocytopenia or uh, any indication of thrombocytopenia in the narrative. For this uh, particular analysis, we did not include the more common thrombosis events um, that I uh, mentioned in the Brighton Collaboration TTS case definition. Um, these events will be evaluated in a, in a subsequent analysis. Medical records are requested for all potential TTS cases to confirm thrombosis with laboratory evidence of thrombocytopenia. And CDC and FDA medical officers reviewed TTS reports and available medical records and CISA experts, including hematologists, were consulted uh, as needed. Next slide. So here is really the, the high level bottom line for reporting rates of TTS after Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. So as of April 21, we had almost 8 million vaccine doses administered with 15 confirmed TTS cases. Um, some of this uh, age and sex specific doses administered data were, were imputed because there were missing variables for, for age or sex. Um, that was a small minority of the data though. There are additional potential TTS cases under review, including some potential male cases. I do wanna mention that one case uh, of, of TTS was excluded from the final analysis. This was a female less than 50 who had a concurrent diagnosis of COVID-19 um, and had a very complicated um, 
uh, clinical picture. We weren't comfortable including that as a case, but we wanted to mention that for transparency. So in this table, uh, on the left-hand side there, you have the age groups, which we have um, split out 18 to 49 years old and 50 plus. Then you have the female, data on the females and data on the males. All these 15 cases were in females and 13 of the 15 were in the 18 to 49 year old age group, the remaining two 50 plus. And you can see the doses administered there in the uh, next column. And that translates into a reporting rate of seven TTS cases per million doses administered of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine for women aged 18 to 49 years old. For women, women 50 plus, this translates to 0.9 TTS cases per million doses administered. You'll see on the right-hand side of this table, there were zero cases in males in either of these age groups. So the reporting rate is zero per million. That does not mean there is, there is um, no risk in males. Um, there, there could be cases that we um, did not identify in the database. Theirs is also subject to under reporting. So there could be cases that simply weren't reported. And there could be cases that become apparent um, uh, later on that just have not, just, just have not appeared. But um, as of now, we had zero cases in males and thus the reporting rates of zero per million for both age groups. Next slide. Uh, when we looked at the, um, the, the graph uh, of patient age in years, um, you can see here's the interval from 18, or it's, it's the complete interval, 18, um, 18 plus. But uh, you can see this apparent clustering of individuals in the uh, mid to late 30s. Um, when we observed this clustering, um, we decided that um, it, would, it would be prudent um, in consultation um, with uh, our vast colleagues and the, and the work group, it would be prudent to take a, a closer look uh, um, at splitting the age intervals a little bit finer um, in women. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is that analysis where we're, we're, we're taking the, uh, the, the, female, uh, the female recipients of COVID-19 disease and the cases and, and, and basically splitting them into finer age groups. Um, for this analysis, we had nearly 4 million doses administered to women. And again, all 15 confirmed cases were in women. Uh, if you look at this, uh, you can you focus in on the 30 to 39 year old age group. Um, this is where we saw the most cases, and this is where we, based on doses administered, had the highest reporting rate, um, which was 11.8 cases per million doses administered. And you'll see in the older age groups, 50 to 64 and 65 plus, um, the reporting rates are lower than in these younger age groups. Next slide. So some of the uh, characteristics of these these case patients. The median age was 37 years, range 18 to 59. Median time to symptom onset was eight days, range six to 15 days. Again, all cases in females. 12 of these cases um, were cerebral venous sinus thrombosis cases. Um, there were no cases that were pregnant or postpartum. Uh, there were two cases um, with COVID-19 disease. However, these were both by history. Um, and fairly remote with no documentation of serology testing. As far as some of these uh, identified risk factors, um, two uh, were on two case patients um, were using oral contraceptives. Um, obesity was fairly common. Um, there were no patients with known coagulation disorders. Next slide. So here's a, a, a graph of, of time from vaccination to symptom onset, a uh, range of six to 15 days. I think the take home message from this is these, uh, these, these, um, these cases um, first experience symptoms, usually around one to two weeks between the first and, and, and second week post vaccination. Next slide. So th this slide shows the signs and symptoms in patients with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis after Janssen COVID-19 vaccines, just limited to those with CVST, a subset of the TTS cases with CVST, which is 12. 
the initial um, presenting symptoms, and, and this was this was restricted to individuals, or at least at least two patients had experienced these symptoms. Initially, were headache, all of which started six or more days after vaccination, chills, fever, nausea, vomiting, malaise, lethargy, and abdominal pain. And you can see some of the uh, signs and symptoms um, later in the clinical course. I think the important uh, message on this slide is that these initial symptoms are fairly vague and nonspecific, um, mainly headache. Um, but importantly, the headaches for these uh, started six or more days after vaccination. I say that because headache is a commonly reported, um, commonly reported adverse reaction after um, vaccination, as particularly after the COVID vaccines. But but for the for the the, the the reactogenic headache that usually occurs on the day after vaccination um, and, and not starting uh, six or more days after vaccination. So that's unusual. Next slide. So the locations of thrombosis um, in these TTP patients, and these are not mutually exclusive. You see the locations for CVST there. Um, uh, transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, confluence of sinuses, straight sinus, superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, and cortical veins. And then for the other locations, portal vein, hepatic vein, superior mesenteric artery, splenic artery, pulmonary artery, and, and, and other vessels, as you see there. Uh, seven patients with CVST did experience an intracerebral hemorrhage. Next slide. So these are the uh, so some of the selected laboratory findings for these TTS patients. Um, all were thrombocytopenic. That's really a, a part of the case definition. Ten were um, severely thrombocytopenic, had platelet counts of less than 50, three between 50 and 100,000, and two between 100,000 and 149,000. Um, when testing was done, all of the cases um, were, had a platelet factor four heparin-induced thrombocytopenia positive ELISA antibody test, um, and four uh, testing was either not available or wasn't done. Next slide. I hear some SARS-CoV-2 testing results. Um, I think the the message here was fairly unremarkable. Although I, I will mention we did have that one potential case which we excluded, and that was, you know, based on the determination that that was a somewhat of a complex and unique case. And I can provide more information on that if the if the committee wishes. Next slide. These are the treatment and outcomes among the TTS patients. Um, six received heparin. 12 got non-heparin anticoagulants, seven platelet transfusions, and eight got IVIG. Um, all those individuals that got treated with heparin, all six of those individuals, that happened before the Han uh, was released. So I think that's at least some indirect evidence that healthcare providers got the message in the Han um, not to treat with heparin um, uh, unless the HIT testing was, was negative. And then outcomes, there were three deaths, um, seven remain hospitalized, four in intensive care, and five have been discharged home. I'll mention that in those three deaths, none of those uh, patients received heparin. Next slide. So now I want to uh, cover some uh, additional analysis we've done in our vaccine safety data link, just to remind you that is our population-based system that we use for near real-time surveillance and research. It has data on over 12 million persons per year, um, mainly from electronic health records and administrative data. Next slide. So I apologize, this is a busy slide, but I felt it was important to fit it all in on one slide, and I'll walk you through it here. Um, this is VSD data on thrombosis events after Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. So I'll just mention there were 142,000 Janssen COVID-19 vaccine doses administered in VSD through April 17th. There have been no statistical signals detected for any pre-specified RCA outcomes. Of course, there's a relatively small number of, of doses, at least compared to the mRNA vaccines. There have been no CVST cases identified following the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. There were 22 VTE and or PE cases identified in the one to 42 days following vaccination, which were quick reviewed. 
Um, and this, this, and these aren't mutually exclusive. So this in, includes two with both VTE and PE. So of these 22 cases, six ruled out as not VTE. Uh, 16 were confirmed as VTE and or PE. Um, four had symptom onset prior to vaccination. And that includes one case with thrombocytopenia documented prior to vaccination. One had an indeterminate onset, and that left us with 11 incident cases following vaccination. Of these 11, six were female, that was two PEs and four VTEs. Five were male, that's one PE, four VTEs. The ages ranged from 50 to 79 years, um, none with a history of COVID-19 infection, and none with thrombocytopenia at the time of VTE or PE. So, um, and, and, and I'll say we're, we're using a bit of a broader uh, case definition than we used with the VAERS analysis. We're including some of these more common um, thromboses for this, uh, this, uh, this uh, for the, for the uh, Janssen VSD um, assessment here. Um, but the, the bottom line is um, we have a small number, relatively small number of Janssen vaccine doses in VSD, but we did not see um, any any uh, any potential cases of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia based on this analysis. Next slide. Next slide. So to sum up, TTS is rare but clinically serious and potentially life-threatening in a potentially life-threatening adverse event that has been observed in association with the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. Symptom onset appears to occur at least several days after vaccination, typically around one to two weeks after vaccination. The clinical features of TTS following Janssen COVID-19 vaccine appear similar to what is being observed following the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine in Europe. It is important to recognize TTS early and initiate appropriate treatment. Um, do not treat TTS with heparin unless HIT testing is negative. The U.S. Vaccine Safety Monitoring System is able to rapidly detect rare adverse events following immunization and to quickly assess safety signals. Safety surveillance and research on TTS continues, and CDC is committed to open and transparent communication of vaccine safety information. Next slide. So as far as next steps, we'll continue enhance monitoring in VAERS and continue surveillance and other vaccine safety systems to include VSD, the CMS data, and the VA electronic health record. That's with our colleagues in FDA and the VA. We plan to expand the VAERS database search strategy for TTS reports. Um, this would include the MEDRA preferred terms for large vessel thrombosis and thromboembolism. Again, all reports, regardless of the presence of thrombocytopenia, which we go in and review to confirm thrombocytopenia, but also MEDRA PTs for more common thrombotic events and MEDRA PTs for thrombocytopenia or text string searches for thrombocytopenia or low platelets in the um, narrative section of the VAERS reports. So that's using a combination. You have to have one of these more common thrombotic events and also evidence in the report of thrombocytopenia. And we will um, review the medical records for all potential TTS case, case reports to confirm the thrombosis and to also confirm the presence of thrombocytopenia. Next slide. And just to remind healthcare providers, um, VAERS is our system uh, for collecting um, rare, serious, adverse events. Um, anyone can report to VAERS. Uh, you can go to the VAERS website and submit a report on the online portal. There are some resources there for assistance if you need help with the system. And just to remind healthcare providers and our public health partners um, that, that if we do request medical records, we appreciate cooperation and HIPAA permits, permits reporting of protected health information to public health authorities, including CDC and FDA, when they're conducting these activities as a public health function. Next slide. I wish to acknowledge the contributions of the investigators from these following organizations. Next slide. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you again, Dr. Shimabukuro, for another excellent and um, uh, well-presented um, um, review. 
Um, so we're going to open this up to questions. Um, and um, let me explain that we will go until about five minutes before the hour, then take a five-minute break, and then begin the public comment session. If there are additional questions or further discussion necessary, I will return to this topic after the public comment session. So um, let me begin with the first hand. It was Dr. Paling. Dr. Paling, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shimabakura, thank you for an excellent presentation. I think um, this data dem clearly demonstrates that the safety systems that have been set up with the FDA and the CDC are working in detecting the events we need to um, see and providing us much needed information. Um, as I understand the presentation from the VAERS, there were 15 confirmed cases. And I believe the slides indicated there are potential cases of TTS under review. My first question is, could you share how many of those cases um, are in the potential review, uh, under review status? And then the second is, could you share information on the case that was um, excluded? Thank you. Sure. I, I'll say it's, it's, a, it's a relatively um, small number of cases that are under review. That's kind of a dynamic number, um, but it's, it's, it's just under 10 right now, um, but that, 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 that does change on a daily basis. Um, that's the short answer to the question, and that's when we're looking at our relatively restricted case definition where we're looking at large vessel thrombosis in these unusual locations in the presence of thrombocytopenia. Um, I would mentioned that we are going to expand our case definition um, to make it more consistent with the draft Brighton collaboration case definition. That includes other um, thrombosis uh, events like uh, venal thromboembolism, DVT, um, PE, ischemic stroke, um, acute myocardial infarction, um, when we when we do expand beyond that, I anticipate we will um, we will have a substantially larger number of cases under investigation. Um, that is that's normal. Uh, those those events are pretty common and commonly reported to VARES. So I, I would say using the more restricted um, uh, using the more restricted case definition, it's a relatively small number, but that number could expand substantially when we broaden out our case definition. Oh, and uh, let me go to, if you could advance further, advance the slide one more. So here's the information on the report of TTS that was excluded from the case count. It was in a female, less than 50, uh, that had COVID-19. She was PCR positive and had a complex clinical course. Um, she was hospitalized twice, um, admitted first time 22 days after vaccination with COVID-19 pneumonia, and she presented um, with nausea, hematemesis, shortness of breath. Um, the date of symptom onset was not clear, and at that time, she had a normal platelet count. Um, she was readmitted uh, 28 days after vaccination, in which she presented with nausea, hematemesis, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, and cough. At that time, she had a platelet count of 100,000, and the imaging studies showed CVST and DVTs and a PE, and she subsequently died during hospitalization. The reported cause of death was respiratory failure, shock, and COVID-19 pneumonia. So um, as you can see here, this was a, a complex um, clinical course where um, the, the cause of, I mean, it was, it was just not so, not so clear um, whether this should be included as a case or not. We ultimately decided in consultation with our colleagues at FDA that we would not include this in the, in the final analysis, but we would certainly mention that this case existed um, and for transparency have this information available for the committee. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein? Yeah, great presentation yeah. as always, uh, Tom. Um, you mentioned in your summary that TTS after the J&J &J vaccine is similar to the AstraZeneca uh, experience. So it seems that viral vector vaccines are associated with TTS. Um, you, 
your d latest data suggests 15 cases per 4 million doses of J&J &J in the United States. Can you remind me what the um, incidence was in Astra AstraZeneca's in uh, Europe and the UK? Uh, I don't have that information um, at hand. I would have to get back to you on that, Dr. Bernstein, um, unless somebody else on the call um, yeah. has better insight on the AstraZeneca data. Dr. Shimabukuro um, and Dr. Bernstein, we have that laid out in the uh, kind of in my presentation coming up. So I'll, I'll let you defer to that and, and we'll walk it out. If you have questions, Dr. Bernstein, after that, I'm happy to, to answer. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I, I think this question is for Dr. Shimabukuro, but it might be more appropriate for Dr. Mishler. My question is that while obviously this is a rare uh, outcome, it is potentially life-threatening. And is the, I'm mindful that the compensation for injury is under the CICP, the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program. And I'm wondering if a vaccine injury table is being developed for the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. This is Tom. I'm going to have to defer to my colleagues at HRSA on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, this is Captain Mishler. The vaccine injury table will be developed, but it is not presently under development. Um, we will have uh, injuries that are on the table, but we also um, give equal consideration to non-table injuries as well. Thank you. Dr. Long. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, first is a comment. The Brighton definition uses a very liberal definition of thrombocytopenia, and I think that it's very likely that that will become contaminated, or you'll have to ratchet down an awful lot till you get to the this syndrome, which is by definition, it's a it's an autoimmune type syndrome, which is characterized by extremely low platelets in many, many patients. So I don't know how they chose, I, I think it was 150,000. It, 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 you know, might, you're gonna have a lot of things that aren't it. So we're glad that you, today you've presented us um, with the, the cerebral venous um, thrombosis part, sinus part. My question is, do you have data for the time between onset of symptoms, especially headache, and first coming to medical attention so we can understand a little bit better if this is rapidly progressive and potentially fatal before uh, any medical intervention could occur, or if there are four or five or six days in which we could educate and uh, potentially save lives. Thank you. I think your question is, time to admission from vaccination. So the person gets vaccinated and when are they actually, are they admitted to an acute care facility? Is that, is that the, what you're looking for? No, not since vaccination. I'm thinking since onset. Oh, You had okay. a comment, column of initial symptoms. And I, I also think that might be time-wise a little contaminated by fever and things that could have been still reactogenic kind of things, but the headache that has the onset uh, at six days and beyond. What, what, for instance, is the time period before that and coming to medical attention? Or we would, I guess we would take hospitalization as um, a possible uh, marker, although they could have been sent home from emergency rooms if we had nonspecific headache. I'm, uh, I'm kind of scanning my additional documents here. I think what you're asking for is the median time and the range from symptom onset to when they are actually hospitalized. That, that when, they, when they have symptoms and when somebody recognizes that this is a problem and they admit them to the hospital. Um, the, the median time for that is five days and the range oh. is zero to 14. Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you. Dr. Dujan. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation, Dr. Shima Bukur. Uh, my question is about the next steps. What is the plan for um, updating um, available information and, and, and how will that be um, made available to the public? Well, we, we will certainly continue our, our um, enhanced surveillance for this condition, our, 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 our case finding, our uh, rapid assessment of cases, our requests for medical records, our review, our consultation with our CISA colleagues to um, do a deep dive into these cases. Um, we have added CVST uh, to uh, our, our VSD rapid cycle analysis, um, and we are uh, we are looking into ways where we can um, automate and become more efficient um, uh, for detecting. Um, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia in our population-based systems, and we will uh, continue to brief the uh, the technical subgroup uh, on a routine basis. They meet weekly, and we're happy to brief the work group at request. and And we will certainly come back to the full ACIP um, uh, whenever whenever we are asked, and uh, we'll try to publish this information soon as possible. We have publications in the works right now, um, but, but certainly we are happy to come back to, to, the, to the ACIP and pre 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 present safety data um, whenever that's needed. Well, I, I, thank you very much. I mean, this level of scrutiny really leaves no doubt that vaccine safety is a top priority for the CDC, for the FDA, and our national program, and I know the public will be interested in hearing ongoing updates of what you're finding, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see no other hands. Do, uh, Dr. Daly, sorry, sorry, forgive me. Yes, Dr. Daly. No, it's okay. I, yeah, I just, I just put my hand up. So I would just echo um, the comments of Dr. Dugin and Dr. Paling, just that this, the very fact that we can detect something this rare um, is an indication of the strength of the vaccine safety monitoring system and, and, uh, and that that monitoring is going to continue. So that's the comment. And then the question, Tom, is about the um, uh, benefits of the pause. Um, do you, is it your sense that sort of, at least by my count, the pause has been on for 11 days and, 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 uh, and is is it your sense that the pause achieved the goal of better understanding these cases and better characterizing them? Uh, I, I, um, I, we would have done this work regardless of whether there was a pause or, or not. I mean, it's certainly the entire totality of the situation um, really caused us to focus in on rapidly assessing these cases. We changed our procedures. Um, we uh, staffed up to do this. So, I, I mean, I, I guess you could argue that the, you know, the, the act of the pause did really focus our efforts on, on, on really getting to the bottom of this quickly so we could come back to the ACIP 10 days later and give you hopefully the data you need to make an evidence-based recommendation. Good. Thank you. Uh, this is Melinda Wharton. Can I make a comment? Uh, of course, Dr. Wharton, please. Uh, so, it, you know, I think there was a very important objective achieved by the pause, which is allowing clinicians to be informed, allowing con clinicians to be informed about the condition, raising public awareness, and providing time to get a better assessment of risk so that, um, that we can have the conversation we're having today. Thank you for those comments. Um, Dr. Fink, please. I, thank you. I, I just wanted to, to mention on, on behalf of FDA that, that we agree with uh, the statements by, by Dr. Wharton and, and Dr. Shilvakuro with uh, regard to the, um, the benefit of the pause. And in, in terms of ongoing efforts, of course, FDA will continue to work closely with, with CDC on uh, evaluating and, and characterizing the, these cases in this, this adverse uh, event. And if uh, any further information comes to light that would uh, warrant additional safety communications or even 
uh, changes to the warning statement to ensure adequate risk mitigation, then we would, of course, uh, do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm looking around my room to see if anybody uh, in from the liaisons or from uh, the um, voting members. I'm not seeing any. Um, so uh, I, I echo all of what has been said. I, I think that this pause was essential uh, to our ability to um, inform the public, inform the physicians, um, and to acquire more data for, for presentation and for analysis. So um, we're going to stop here, as I mentioned previously, give about an eight-minute break, and then we'll come back at the top of the hour for um, the uh, public comment session. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you at uh, the top of the hour.